in October of 2018, I saw that the yield curve was flattening. In other words, that interest rates were coming together and I shared it with everybody immediately. Then on December 4th, 2018, the yield curve inverted. So the shorter term rates went above the longer term rates. And I did a video, emergency pattern shift, where I alerted everybody that this was it. And typically when that occurs, you got 18 months before you see a recession. Well, here we are on June 8th, we got the official word, we are in a recession. So today I'm going to show you three patterns, historical patterns that will tell us what is happening now and what is the next most likely outcome. Because frankly, the day of the dollar is coming to an end. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive the reset that I hope you all recognize we are already walking through. And today is a very important video maybe one of the most important that we've done in quite a while because we are now in official recession. And as I said, that was called back in December, on December 4th of 2018. And here we are, June, 4, June 8th of 2020. Hmm, that's pretty darn close to that 18 month window. And it is absolutely official. History is repeating itself. They said it was different this time, that this was a going to tell about a recession. But even before the coronavirus, we were already entering a global recession. And recently, as I showed you, actually, I think even last week, that the Fed was telling us, the New York Fed, they anticipate a GDP, gross domestic product, that's the money that flows through the system, decline of 54% according to their data and what we're projecting. But I got to read this to you. Despite the speed and severity of the shock, and I think we'll all agree it was a big shock, it is suggested that the rebound could be very swift because it looks like we're out of the woods because of the tremendous speed and quantity of both fiscal and monetary stimulus. In other words, the speed and quantity of all that new money that's been put into the system. But honestly, if it really worked, well, what about all of that money that they've put into the system since 2008? We were already entering a global slowdown and there are a record number of countries around the world that are plunging into recession. A record number. So it's happening everywhere. And yet the U.S. markets rallied. In fact, NASDAQ made a new all-time high. Whoop-de-doo. Happy days are here again. Why? Why did that happen? Well, as they were talking about the speed and the quantity, when you look at what happened in 2008 and you look at where we are now, mm, kind of says it all. Because once central banks create new money, that new money must go someplace but they also need it to be really cheap because what central banks do is lend. Governments spend, but central banks lend. That means enable entities to take on more debt. But at some point when you have debt, you've got to deal with it in some way. 
So these were the expectations which were firmly met today. They call it Fed expectations. Okay, they expected that there would be no change at the Fed meeting. And that was pretty much true, except that Fed Pal said that he is not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. So he's telling everybody, we're keeping rates at zero for as far as the eye can see, which is exactly what Japan has been doing for many, 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 many years. Lost decade, lost two decades, lost three decades. Okay, so it's the Japafination, or however you would say it, of the U.S. economy. And most Entities, most people, most economists expect even more money coming from the Fed. In fact, they expect another $2.8 trillion. But frankly, they've already said it's an unlimited amount. So it'll be much, much higher than that. That'll look like chump change, I'm betting, eventually. And they're expecting rates, again, to stay basically zero bound. So what does all of this mean? Well, what more will they do? Database forward guidance. Well, he didn't even say database forward guidance. He said he's not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. So he's telling Wall Street what they are going to do. So Wall Street, phew, okay, if you're going to give me unlimited money, I am going to go ahead and I'm going to borrow it and I'm going to trade in these markets. I'm going to push these markets up because you're telling me I'm going to transfer wealth my way just in this way. You can have all the money that you want. That's what they're really saying. And we're going to make sure it is super duper cheap. But it gets to a point, and they lament the fact that they can't hit their 2% inflation target. And they lament that. So, hey, we can do a whole lot more of cheap or even free money. Why can't they hit their 2% target? Because at some point when you have debt, you still have to service that debt. And if all or most of your income goes to paying interest, it's going to have a weight on the economy. And remember, I don't have this graph in here, but I use it all the time on the monetary velocity. We hit peak monetary velocity in 1997. And that means that that was the last time that taking on more debt was actually economically stimulating. And I got to say, these guys know this better than I do, but think about it for yourself. If you just keep getting credit card after credit card after credit card, and you're paying the minimum, that means that you're now compounding interest and you're not even touching the principal. You ever getting out of debt? Heck no. But if you know you're going to declare bankruptcy and they send you more credit cards, what are you most likely to do? Spend it. So let's talk a little bit about the stock market and why it's been on such a tear upwards. Okay, because certainly part of it is the Federal Reserve. The reality is, is most people believe the economy is going to take a long time to recover. But that doesn't seem to matter. Additionally, 79% of those uh, interviewed or, or polled think that relative to earnings and, GP and GDP forecasts, stocks are overvalued. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that should be 300%. Do you know how much stocks are going to earn this year? No, there's no guidance on it. And nobody knows when the economy is going to fully open up again. Or when people, because of the high unemployment levels, when they're going to actually start, I don't know, shopping again. And with such high employment numbers, you know, or unemployment numbers, I should say, they're going to have to do something. That's why I really think that we're going to have some form of universal basic income, UBI, a lot of people call it, by the end of this year. I'm, you know, I could be wrong. That's not something within my control, but it makes a whole lot of sense. But even though the stocks are up, 
markets can stay insane a whole lot longer than you would ever expect them to be able to. So what's really moving? I think this is incredibly interesting and takes us back to 1928. And I'm going to come to that in just a second because investors are flocking to bankrupt stocks. They're calling it a dash for trash. Unbelievable. Hertz that just declared bankruptcy is up. And this is one week, one week, 451%. Peerwood Imports, they're closing stores all over the place. They've declared bankruptcy, two up, one week, 291%. Whiting Petroleum declared bankruptcy, up. 212% JCPenney, that's been struggling for so long, up 145%. Does any of this make sense to you? Frankly, it shouldn't. Though again, markets can stay insane a whole lot longer than you would think. Now, a lot of this is certainly due to the flood. It's more than that. The tsunami of new money injected and continuing to be injected by the global central banks led by the Federal Reserve. No doubt about that. But aside from that, who's driving these markets higher? I mean, are they really investors? Heck no, they're speculators. But it's not the typical trader. Yeah, the traders are definitely taking advantage of this. And I love this headline because frankly, I could not agree with it more. It's a perfect storm of stupid in the stock market right now. Great headline. Now, let me show you why it's a perfect storm of stupid. For one thing, what are we seeing? You know, there's been that extra bump in unemployment, weekly unemployment. So a lot of people, 70%, I believe the studies say, are making more on unemployment than they did when they were working. So they kind of have some extra money. Plus that $1,200 uh, check that was sent out to a lot of people, their home, the businesses were closed. They're starting to reopen now. We'll talk more about that. But close to 800 people have created new brokerage accounts in the top three uh, online brokerages in the country, in the U.S. Because what, what did they do? Do you remember we talked about this? They took the fees to trade down to zero. The other thing that they've done is allowed fractional trading. Now, all right, let me explain fractional trading to you. Because, you know, if you have like a mutual fund or a stock, and let's say you're reinvesting the dividends, and so instead of buying a whole share, maybe it'll buy a tenth of a share or a half a share or whatever it'll buy. That's fractional. Just like you can buy a full ounce of gold, but if you buy less than an ounce of gold, that's fractional makes it easier for people that don't have a lot of money to buy because now they don't have to spend, say, you know, what Warren Buffett's uh, shares or something like 300,000. I don't really know what they are. I haven't looked it up, but I think it's something like that. So if you want to own that, well, now instead of having to come up with 300 grand for one share, you can put any amount in there and buy a fraction of that share. But keep in mind, that other, I disagree with this statement a little bit. There is no model that can predict what's about to happen in the economy or the market, but I can take you back to 1928 because in 1928, that was the first time that the naive public started piling into the stock market. I mean, after all, they saw it going up, up, up. There was a flood as they were transitioning us into a consumer-driven economy. There was a flood of cheap credit and the normal person wanted to emulate. They wanted to participate in the rising stock market. However, what was also happening during that period of time was that Wall Street insiders that understood what was happening, they were selling into the naive, unsuspecting public. Well, just this week, here we go, 
the market handed billions to two companies that made headlines without showing any real data. And we talked about this last week, Moderna being one, because they had eight patients in their study that showed some benefit. Eight patients, eight, eight, right? And what did the executives over there do? Well, they took advantage of it. Of course they did. Moderna executives have cashed out 89 million in shares this year as the stock price has soared on vaccine hopes. Shocker. No, that's the way it always happens. And I've shown you that many, many, many times how the insiders were selling out and who was buying? Mm institutional investors. Those are the entities that invest for 401ks and pension plans and mutual funds and those kinds of things. So naive public was buying what the insiders were selling plus stock buybacks. But that's another story for another day because in this pandemic, a lot of that has been cut back. I also love this tweet. Stocks priced at less than a dollar. This is from Leslie Picker, who is a CNBC correspondent. Stocks priced at less than $1 in the Russell 2000, so there are 29 stocks, are up 79% on average over the last five trading days. You know why I never traded penny stocks? Because you couldn't tell what was going on, and it was a churn and burn. And this too will be a churn and burn. In other words, it's the greater fool theory, expecting somebody even more stupid to be willing to pay more for these stocks. And these guys, you know, think that, wow, I'm really smart. Look at this. I'm buying it and the stock is going up and it works until it doesn't. So we talked about the three largest firms, but also at Fidelity, they've opened 1.2 million in new accounts. That's a lot. So you're really looking at 2 million recent new accounts and going into the fractional trading frenzy. So like the cheap money, a lot of this money is coming from that 1,200 bucks, so the, the extra 600 bucks, cheap money, and they'll probably give us more. But what I found really interesting about this is that 52% of the members' first trades on the platform are fractional. That tells you it's the little guy. It's the guy that really doesn't know what they're doing. Are they bothering to do all of this research and determine, is this a long-term trade? No, no, no. Is this a long-term hold, I should say? No, no, no. This is a short-term trade for them. They're playing. A lot of what's happened is these programs have been gamified. So the millennials that have grown up with gaming, and now you make the trade free, and you give them extra money, this is actually not such a big surprise, but it is a typical pattern before a major market crash. And I'm gonna tell you, I don't know how long they can keep this going, perhaps longer than I think possible, but there will be a major market crash. And I hope you're out before that actually happens, because that would not be a good thing. In fact, 40% of all trades are made in dollar amount. Okay, I'm gonna throw five bucks at it, or 20 bucks at it, or 100 bucks at it. Buy 10 shares, or not 10 shares, buy 10 different stocks, and you're gonna throw 10 bucks at it. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, while overall, I don't think it's a big, pro I, I actually think it's a fractional tr uh, shares are a good idea to help people accumulate. In this way, this is more about keeping the market buoyant and these definitely naive, naive, naive traders. Because these fiat markets, they're so easily manipulated. All they are are contracts. That's all they are. And a wonderful viewer, he sends me great stuff all the time. I didn't ask him permission to use his name, so I cut it out. But he sent me this. 
to show a relative performance chart on the behavior on the spot gold, spot silver, and the Dow. So I want you to understand these are all contracts. Um, it was really kind of hard to read, so I pulled it up in stockcharts.com, which anybody can access, no big deal. And you can see that from the beginning of this year, spot gold is up 11%. The Dow, because of this massive run that it just had, is up 7% on this one when he sent me. Spot silver was actually outperforming um, the Dow. And spot silver is up 2%. But look at how volatile this is. And you can also see on this relative performance chart, chart how uh, that gold-silver ratio is closing, right? Because silver's price is moving up faster, the contract price is moving up faster than spot gold contract price. But it's more closely, silver is more closely tied to manufacturing and the economy in that way. So what's the difference? Why, why not? Because if Wall Street has their druthers, if you absolutely must get gold, they're going to prefer you to get a contract like GLD, an ETF. But here's the difference. In, with physical gold, you can take possession and it runs no counterparty risk. All these other contracts, whatever they are, ETFs, the intangibles, those are all counterparty risks because a stock is intangible. And what it really reflects is fiat money inflation. So a lot of the reason why these markets are going up is because of the commitment by the central banks to create an unlimited amount of new money. And that monetary inflation drives the value, the purchasing power value of the money that's already out here, the fiat money that's out here, down. But it also drives the real value of physical gold up and also the reset value. Because remember, central banks lend, governments spend. So this inflation creates nominal confusion. Woohoo! Look at this. The Dow is up beating spot silver. And hey, the NASDAQ made new nominal highs. But is that really what the truth is? Mm, I don't think so. And Jeffrey Gunlack, who is a major hedge fund guy, and he sees stocks falling, gold rising, despite Superman Powell's heavy lifting. In other words, in spite of all of that money printing, in spite of the interest rates being at zero, and let me tell you, if he's saying, if Powell is saying he's not even gonna think about thinking about raising rates, what does that really tell you? That means we're in deep, deep, deep trouble. But what isn't? Okay, well, here you go. He, Jeffrey, made a comparison and I encourage everybody to go in and watch his slide presentation, listen to it, the links are on our blog. He compared the S&P 500 price in gold to its nominal value. So here we see the nominal value of the S&P going up because of all that money inflation. But in terms of the spot price, it's actually gone down. And actually, when you're looking at the spot price, I mean, what? If you're a central bank, it's 110 bucks. And if you're a commercial bank, it's 150 bucks to control 500 ounces of gold. So somewhere around eight, nine hundred thousand dollars controlled by 150 bucks. Are you kidding me? I mean, that is leverage. But they have to use all of these tools to keep you in the dark. But now you know the truth. Because when you look at the real fundamental value of gold, spot gold, that's a contract, easily manipulated. But when they do the reset, they reset the fiat 
currency, which in this country is the U.S. dollar, against real money gold. And that, at the minimum, is at more than 11500 right now. So even at 1700 or 5000 or 8000 it's a bargain. And, by the way, it is the only undervalued asset that is in a long-term positive trend because the reality is, is the dollar is in a long-term negative trend. And that's what stocks are valued in. So that is another pattern that we're looking at here. History is likely to repeat itself. This time is not different. Please use this opportunity to get yourself protected. Wear your holes. Food, water, energy, security, community, shelter, barterability, silver, wealth preservation, gold. Get it done while you can. Now, I just did an interview with Tony, and he had some technical difficulties, but you can hear the whole interview anyway, even if you're not able to see everything. And then uh, next, is it next week with Gerald? I have my good friend, Gerald Salente, and I'm sure with what's going on and the reopening and he's in New York, et cetera, that should be quite an interesting discussion. It always is. I always love having those with Gerald. And then on, on Thursday, I'm with DJ Randy on Standing on the Edge, which is BFAM 109.6. On, and that, again, is on Thursday. You'll find all of the links to these. Follow those links. Go to our blog at itmtrading.com forward slash blog. Of course, this is posted on Brightian and Facebook and in our blog as well. But if you're really concerned, and you should be, I mean, if you're not, I, I don't know, you must be sleepwalking. But we are here to be of service. You can click that Calendly link below, make an appointment to talk to one of our consultants who's also a strategy specialist. And if the time you want isn't available, we love human contact, 888-696-4653. And keep in mind, it is absolutely positively, without a doubt, time to cover your assets. And you do that with the Wealth Shield, which is part of our strategy. It is a 12-piece program to help you survive and thrive the reset that we've already entered into. It's not something that I'm waiting for. Because financial shields are made of physical gold and silver. Not paper contracts, that's for sure. So if you like this, please give us a thumbs up. Make sure you share this one. Share, share, share. Subscribe, hit that bell. We'll let you know when we're going live. And until tomorrow, please, seriously, things are shifting quickly. Please be safe out there. Bye-bye.